Okay. Thank you, Raj, everybody, for joining me today. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you are. Um, this is season two, episode one of Break Free from Your Monkey Mind. Last season was really about empowering people to take responsibility to go and see their own GP by introducing different modalities that you could go rather than just being medicalization only. So this season, what we want to look at is, I looked at what was the more popular ones, episodes from last year, or last season, and if episode one, which is my story, and the story on the last episode, which is a student from Open University, Mark, whose mental health had caused her basically to lose everything he's like, and he's having to work back Again, he try and get Evan back, which he is doing okay with now, so he's been doing great with that. But what I want to do here is to get people on who have actually been through all of this, so their side of it, but rather than just talking about stories, is actually talking about what we could do, what we did to get to where we are, and how it could help use other people, maybe notice signs in yourself or in others. So on that basis, I want to welcome here Dave Hefferman. Dave's a mental health trainer, um, so I met through a course that was on recently, and as we talk, I'll explain a bit more about how we got together. So, morning, afternoon to you, Dave, and how are you today? Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm okay. It's a bit grizzly and wet here in uh, Cheshire, but the birds are happy. Uh, well, it's the same as we are. I think where we are, it's actually that way. Only the ducks are happy, but it's gone okay. <laughs> so, as I mentioned there, the, um, what I wanted to look at was we spoke recently um, about after a talk that you did and I said your talk really inspired me well, to realise that only in the podcast have I ever really explained my story and only part of it. Um, but after listening to you, I realised that if I'm expecting people to come to me for help or to come to the podcast explaining what they need, I need to do more of that as well. So that's something I'm looking at getting my story out there more. So people understand that I can at least empathise that I know certain things they're going through. I can't understand totally because I'm never in their shoes. But at least if they can see something like that, it gives them hope maybe that if somebody like me can come through it, so can they. But you've also seen things like that. And just even just for a couple of minutes, could you give a brief outline of what it was, the talk you did, and why it was so important to you? Yeah, so the talk that we're discussing now at the moment is called Dead Man Walking. And it basically covers my story growing up in a place called Salford, which was um, a place called Odstall, which was a, the roughest council estate in the whole of Europe. And we had Salford docks as our backdrop. So there's a lot of crime, a lot of poverty, a lot of deprivation. Um, <clears throat> I've got quite a unique backstory in the fact that from a very young age, I started serving funerals from the age of five. I became very used to grief and death at such an early age. At the age of eight, I'd sit with adults and I'd just allow them to pull the heart out. And so from eight years old, I was almost like a grief counsellor. But what that taught me was about active listening and how that is so powerful. And because at eight years old, I couldn't offer advice to these people, but I could listen. And in the years since, from the age of, sort of 18 onwards, I've supported probably about 2,000 people onwards who have been suicidal and that's all been done as a direct result of listening and not judging. Um, got a story of I was arrested for arson, I was homeless at the age of 16, um, I've had three death threats, I've had three broken jaws, several beatings um, and more recently I've been diagnosed with motor neuron disease, um, severe spinal canal stenosis and paralysed diaphragmatic and viral lung capacity. But I've met each of these, although at, time, at the time it was quite adverse and quite horrific, the lessons that I've been learning from it has really helped me move my life forward. Mm, that's brilliant. And it, so the one thing that was really inspiring for me that night hearing that was something that was really important to me, but it was the resilience that you actually spoke about. But yeah. more than I've even done, the thing that I learned from yours is you learned it from such a young age. I didn't start really, I suppose, realising that until later in life. But you've shown that... But something, the comment you actually made that really hit home to me is if we look back on things we've done in life, people always say about regrets. But you said something about a story that someone told you that if we can accept and acknowledge those decisions we make, good or bad, at that moment in time, you can never regret anything. Is that something that really has stayed with you through your life? That's possibly one of the biggest um, lessons and impacts of my life. Um, I remember eight years old, as I say, I'd sit with adults who were grieving and they'd pull their hearts out. And all I kept on hearing was the words, I wish I, or I wish they. And 
when we're in a heightened emotional state and then we've got suggestions coming in and you know different words coming in it has a profound impact on yourself and it goes really deep level and i saw the pain um and the anguish on these people's faces and all i could associate it with was regret i wish i i wish they and i remember speaking to the priest and asking him the question how do i live a life with no regret because it terrified me at such a young age it terrified me and i didn't really know what regret was i just knew it was bad i just knew it was horrendous and the priest rather than telling me to go away he actually sat me down and said dave to make to live a life with no regret you need to make peace with your decisions both good and bad immediately I remember walking out of that church, eight years old, shaking my head, shaking my fist, saying, no regret, no regret, no regret. And I think that was a beautiful lesson at such a young age to really put me in the best possible position to tackle anything else that happened after that point. That's brilliant. And yeah, because when you explained that, I think it was that I said, it's not, listening to your story is amazing for the facts. It's amazing for the resilience. But I think for the audience, especially there that night, we were all therapists that were there, and everyone was taken aback. And it was more, I think, by your the tonality. It was the change in accents and your voice when you got to certain points. You could see how obviously it'd been difficult for you facing all these things, but it's the way that you could you dealt with them, the way you got you didn't just cope, you actually dealt more. And I think that's how I really learned because for a lot of my life, that was the problems I didn't. I was really brought me an old school days, trying to be too hard, trying to be too strong, always had to be the one that everybody could look up to then, the big man that sort of, that didn't admit that was getting wrong, I wouldn't show people was getting wrong. And because of that, that's when I didn't learn the resilience to, or realise I had been resilient, but because of that, I was dealing with the wrong way. And it's only someone recently we had a thing, I think I did it in the last series called ACT, um, an acceptance um, sort of therapy that made me realise that I needed to do, be a bit more flexible to myself, but more malleable with my decisions, not always looking at good or bad, things can be in between. And your story really hit home with that because we realised there's quite a crossover in a lot of it between us. And the fact that we've both been homeless, the fact that I've been growing up in rough areas or anybody who's Scottish will not here, I grew up in Easter House. Um, but more so I think than later in life, as a couple of years ago when I had my issue and the breakdown, because I'd, I've been dealing with an illness for a long time and find out they can't help me anymore yet. But also at the same time, they get told you've got cancer. Um, luckily for me, my cancer has been cut out, but I still have this thing. Your dead man walkers we got me is every three months, I need to get a blood test on to see if it's actually spread. And then the fact of what I know going through with the, M the MRI scans that I need to get each year and looking at if it has spread, they go through again to get the biopsies again and you're always got all that waiting time it's not actually knowing what the issue is it's the waiting in between and not knowing and that allowed me to think is how dark a place I actually got to um it's only now that I can look back on it so I lost a lot of memory from the day it happened but since you think the other night I did say that day it was a song at the beginning that you put on and I kind of get it out of my head um it was so powerful to me because it made me realize how dark and deep I really got if I hadn't have really broke down that day, I don't know where I would have ended up because it was building up and building up inside me that it was ready to explode somehow. And I didn't really understand a lot about it. But as I you explain this with a song, because probably you know better than me why you picked it, but it's such a powerful image for people to understand what depression actually is. So if you could explain what the song was. Yes, certainly. It's the old Sam and Garfunkel song, Sound of Silence, but done by a group called Disturbed which is a heavy metal, um, a very heavy metal group, in fact, and not one of my genres that I enjoy listening to, in fairness. And, but when I first heard this song, I, I thought they captured the message within that song perfectly. Um, and even Paul Simon, the Simon Garfunkel um, partnership, wrote to the lead singer of Disturbed when he heard it for the first time and said, you've nailed it. He said, you've now owned this song. Um, which I thought was, you know, very humble from him. Um, but also, you know, it was spot on. I think that song was made for that version. Uh, yeah. So if people want to listen to it, it is Disturbed and the Sound of Silence. The reason why I um, picked that song, in fairness, was I feel I've got an important message to get out there. Um, and my life has happened in the way it has for a reason. And I'm a great believer in 
we've got a moral obligation. If we've been through adverse moments in our life, adverse times, as long as we make peace with that, I've got a massive belief in the fact that we've got a moral obligation to help others using our story. Mm -hmm. um, whether that's through the Samaritans, through radio, through podcasts, through whatever it may be, but we need to use those experiences for the greater good. Um, and I just felt the message wasn't getting out there. You know, people walking through life aimlessly, just accepting this is what it is. Um, and, you know, we can be so much more. You know, we hear so many times, don't look back. We're not driving in that direction. But it's so important that we do look back because in every experience that we go through, I guarantee there is a positive in the learning curve. Mm. I guarantee it. And as a speaker, I've gone through my life micromanaging it. And I guarantee in every situation I've been through, even the most horrendous situations, there has been a positive and there's been a learning curve, which can help us grow. But for so many, we just look at the negatives and we stay in a state of depression or being low. But if we can look back and accept, because anxiety and stress live where there's resistance to what is. The fact is those experiences happened. We can't do anything about it but we can certainly extract all the positive side of it. We can extract the learning curves and then just don't worry about the stuff. Don't put any energy to the stuff that we can't influence, the things that we can't change. Because if we do that, that's where we stay in depression. And that's where people have mental breakdowns and unfortunately end the life through suicide because they can't see any hope. And I sit here now 100% that every story that we've got, there is hope within it. We just need to search a little bit harder so it's just, it's just getting that message out there. And I feel for, I felt for a long time that message wasn't being heard. I think I'm cracking it now a little bit. Um, but I just want people to wake up and understand that, you know, these things have happened for a reason. Let's utilize them for the greater good and not stay in a state of, you know, there's a phrase, isn't there? It's okay not to be okay. And although I subscribe to that message, I still believe they've got it slightly wrong. I think it should be, it's okay not to be okay, but don't stay in that state. Mm. I think people have picked this message up and they've almost used it as a crutch, as an excuse to stay low and stay depressed. Whereas if we can actually just let it out, because it's important to offload, it's important to just let it all out. But once we've done that, then we need to try and move forward and we need to go in the, the positive direction. If we stay in that state, we just create habits and then we just sink further and further and further into depression. And we don't want that. Thank you. And there's a couple of great things you said there you mentioned. One was about habits and two is about the way people keep themselves in it. One of the things that you find a lot is people introduce themselves, their name and they're depressed or they're anxious. But they're not. They suffer from these things, but they're not the person. They don't identify with that. It's not who you are. And that's what we want to highlight today is I'm going to give a few stats in a moment. It's quite short when we heard this, but looking at these things, the one thing that really stuck out for both of us when we're doing it is how many men actually go through the same things we did, but then don't luck enough. We got through it, but they don't. And it was a real eye on me after listening to your talk. It was the one thing I wanted to do because I thought that when I look back then at mine, I looked further back, you're right, why? Because for eight years before that, I knew that I'd been suffering. I said, I've been trying to work at it. But I never really dealt with it properly at all. I was coping, but the coping mechanisms weren't right either. And a lot of people do it in different ways. But what it does make me realise, and I love what you said, is you need to look back. A lot of times, I know people in therapy are told to just look at the moment or look ahead or that. But if you don't look back, you can never learn from the episodes you've been through. They made you the person you are. And if you can just release, you're right, the emotion from the learnings. Now, that's what we do as therapists. And because of the, what we've been through, I think we have a unique understanding for that, for people, that we can understand that the mind always has a positive intention, even if it doesn't look, it doesn't seem to you at the time, but it has because it's trying to protect you. It's just in different ways we deal with that. But if we can get more people to that, to come and get that help, to release those unnecessary emotions, but leave the learnings there, it takes a weight off the shoulder. I actually feel they start walking. It looks like nearly a foot taller. And I got that from a lady yesterday who had walked with for a few weeks. That family and friends said they cannot believe the way she is. And some did a session where yesterday said, I wish I had a pint of what she has on because she's so upbeat now. But she said that to me, it's more than that. It was the way everything's just been lifted. She feels lighter as well. Like she's put stones lighter. Um, it's amazing 
how people can feel that way when they start to understand. But one thing just to put it into context, as I said, some stats we looked at, especially after listening to your session, that song really hit on me as depression. As I could actually feel again the emotions that I felt two years ago. Um, and it really got me the song. So I looked up, if I hadn't been lucky enough then, I'd be a statistic like this. Three times as many men as women die by suicide in the UK. Men aged 40 to 49 have got the highest suicide rates in the UK. Most people were at one, but a real shock was that's when people really in the prime of their lives. So it's a real concern. Why is that happening then? Nearly three quarters of adults who go missing are male, and 87% of people who are homeless or sleep rough are male. Men are nearly three times as likely to use things like alcohol or drugs as a dependency, and they use the reason is I'm trying to cope with what I've got, which is the wrong way of doing it, but it's the only way they know. But the biggest thing that really got to me was in 2017, there was a, a survey done of this, and it looked at 6,000 suicides in Great Britain in 2017. That's incredible, 6,000, but 75% were men, and the largest cause of death of men under 50 that year was suicide. And that's something that really, really got to me reading that, as you, you mentioned earlier, to get this message out. And I know this can seem, especially the first episode of a new podcast, is a bit dark, but it's because that's the message we have to get across. That's how people actually feel, as they're in darkness, they are alone. They feel as though they can't let anybody else know because they're letting people down, or they let themselves down, they let their families down. But that's none of that's actually true. It's only in their own head. And it's how they're dealing or think they're dealing with these emotions. But they can get help. We've both done that. We've both got help. We're still on journeys. I'm not saying it. I mean, your thing says them are walking thing. It's that a serious name. But it does let people realise unless they get out of that spiral, that's how they're feeling all the time. They feel it every day. Is that how you feel about it? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's important. Um, <clears throat> just to put a bit of context into this as well. Only two days ago, um, my wife's uh, family friend of many, many years, since she was a child, in fact, um, unfortunately he hung himself two days ago um, on his wife's birthday. Um, and unfortunately his 18-year-old girl opened the curtains and he was hanging from the three. So the thing is, you say that this is you know dark and it's not good, but this is happening. Yeah. This is real. You know, and the vast majority of people who are left behind from the ones who have ended the life through suicide pretty much say, I would never have expected them to do that. Mm -hmm. I would never have expected them. So we need to start waking up. And I think we're doing a, a better job than previous years, in fact. We've got some incredible clubs out there now for men, such as Anders Man Club, you know, um, Loose Heads. You know, some incredible... You know, papyrus as well, you know, for the younger um, people, some incredible charities out there and community groups where I think there's a, there's a myth out there that men don't talk. I think what the problem has been is men haven't get, been given the opportunity to talk. Mm -hmm. um, and in my experience, I used to work with a pre and postnatal depression charity and I used to look after the, men, the men's section. And I'd be getting hundreds and hundreds of messages every single day from men who just couldn't understand the wife's illness. There was threatening violence. Um, there was depression. It's been shown and proven now that men do get postnatal depression as well. Um, and so they was going through all this. And I said at the very start, I said, I want you to look at this social media platform as being like an online version of a pub. You'll go to the bar and you might just sit at the bar and just drink into your drink and just not talk. You may go to the bar and talk to the barman and upload, or you may just meet up with mates and just talk. There's no pressure to talk, but I just want a safe place where you know, should you need to talk, you will not be judged and you will be heard. Mm -hmm. And I think men don't believe they will be heard because with the being conditioned and society's been conditioned to believe Men don't talk about this sort of stuff. Men shouldn't talk about this sort of stuff. Men are breadwinners. Men are, you know, the hunter-gatherers and all that sort of stuff. And at the end of the day, you know, the more opportunities we give men to open up in a safe space where they can be heard without judgment, that 6,000 figure will go down and down and down. But until we do that, it will only rise. Um, my own personal experience, you know, in 
1992, I went through a horrendous experience where I felt a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. Um, a young girl that I was um, supporting as an outreach worker, she unfortunately um, was killed. And I blame myself for not getting her out of that situation. And I lay in the bath one night and I couldn't see a way out and I tried to end my life. Um, luckily, it was just a cry for help and it wasn't a real sort of attempt. But it was terrifying how quickly I could get into that state. And I think this is where most people fall down is they think it's over years or over months and months and months, but it can be literally days or weeks where people go from seemingly normal to being so low that they can't see a way out. Yeah. And I think where most people need, I think, support because life takes over. The last 18 months or years with the pandemic, we've started not being selfish, but we've got our own problems. We've got our own baggage to deal with. And so we've been become less tolerant of other people's mm. concerns or worries or issues. And people aren't noticing the sort of changes. They're just putting, no, it's COVID. They'll, they'll get through it. When COVID finishes, we'll, we'll get through it. The pivotal moment where people really need to be switched on is when they've gone from that dark and horrible place to feeling and looking on the surface quite content and calm. Mm. Because that's the point where they pretty much made the decision. They're putting all their affairs in order. And that's the critical moment where we need to sort of ask the question, are you suicidal? Too many people, again, are scared of asking that question, thinking they can force people into suicide. It is one of the questions that will save more people than we'll ever know. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can just keep a check on other people's behavior patterns, and if they go from being quite positive, I did a, just to digress a little bit, but I, I did a, a, a post on Facebook last year, and I'm quite a positive person, not be always, you know, very rarely the negative unless I'm talking about Liverpool Football Club, but there's very rarely any negative sort of stuff on my social media. And I went into this massive run about how low I was feeling, how crap I was feeling and all this that stuff. And you got the usual, oh, you're okay, inbox me, blah, 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 blah. But not one single person picks up the phone. Now, that was a huge change in character. You know what? I motivate people for a living. You know, I'm constantly out there giving positivity. Yeah, I'm there right out into the world saying, I'm not feeling good. And it was a, you know, it wasn't a case of me not feeling good or anything like that. I was, I was feeling great. I just wanted to do an experiment. Not one single person. And this is what worries me is we live in a society where we think we only have to do a little bit and we've relinquished responsibility. Mm -hmm. Inbox me, hon. Relinquish responsibility. I've done my bit now. I can back off. And the problem with that is I've helped so many people over the over the years where I've been tagged and I've picked up the phone to them and said, if you want a phone, I would have been gone now because I tried ringing my friend who says, I'm there for you all the time. Whenever you need me, I'm there. And they didn't answer the phone. And it could have been three o'clock in the morning. They could have been legitimately sleeping. But these people who are looking at ending their lives through suicide, they're not thinking logical at that point. They're just yeah. thinking, this person said he was going to be in. They've already convinced themselves they're better off out of this world. So if they pick up the phone and nobody answers on the other side, that just confirms their belief that they're not needed. Mm. They're not wanted the better off out of this world. And so we have to be so careful with what we put out there on social media. And if one thing I could change is people stop being so quick with their offer of help. There should always be a caveat there. You know, here's a Samaritan's number, here's a Barbarian's number, here's a men's health number, whatever. Because I always say to people that, you know, I will be there, but there will be times when I won't be. So... You know, if you do decide to pick up the phone to me and I'm not answering the phone, it's not because I don't care. There are people who are there 24-7 like Samaritans who will pick up the phone. And I always give that caveat. And if we can just focus on our, the way we deal with social media, you know, again, that could save so many lives. Yeah. Setting expectations. Um, but yeah, I, I remember how dark I felt and how, how low I felt when I was picking up that razor blade um, and it will never leave me it will never leave me you know what I mean and 
there's always a chance, you know what I mean? Everybody's got a breaking point. Everybody's got a breaking point. And I use all these strategies to help me cope and I'm resilient and everything else, but there's only so much. There's only mm-hmm. so much that we can flip. And we just all need to be conscious of other people. We just all need to sort of step off the treadmill a little bit, slow down and start noticing these sort of changes in people's behavior and being proactive rather than reactive. Because mm-hmm. one you said there that actually was something I was going to mention, Something I was dealing with recently, it wasn't for this, they were, they've actually got a bit further stage before they've came to me, so that was lucky with that side for me, that they've realised their issues. But what he said was, the thing that pushed them to actually do the attempt to suicide was, it seems you, he did say that in his mind at that moment, he wanted to kill himself. But as he was doing it, he had this thing in the back of his mind, I want to live. It was, it was a conflict within his head. But the one that pushed him over was because he had a friend who was a good friend. Um, they hadn't been in touch for a little while because he'd locked his cell away. But when he put a post that you said, he put this thing out and see, it's one of those ones that you repost and see how many of your friends get back to you. Not sharing, but re put it, paste, copy and pasting. And this one friend put on it, I've done that. Remember, I'm always here whenever you need me. He rang him three times and couldn't get him. He left it that night and said, okay, same as you say, maybe he's busy or maybe he's looked fine. He rang him the next day twice and the phone went off really quickly as if the person had pressed the button and knocked it off. Now he could have been busy, but in his head that was five times. So he's ignoring me. And that's why he said he sat down and done it because he was the last person that he could really go to. He had nobody else. He'd fell out with his family, ever because of where he was. He didn't feel, he went to a GP who told him they would refer him for help. He'd still be waiting six months later and there's no help. They had nothing had signed of it. And he not even had a letter from the hospital yet to say they were looking at it. And yet the one person who tells him on there and he thought that's hope, and yet they ignored that. Now, whether they did or not, they, they, he never really learned a lot of detail after, but it did turn out the person was away for the weekend and didn't want to take the calls, but didn't realise how serious it was. But, but you said, why did they put that post on in the first place then? Because they're away, they don't want to take the calls, they're away with family or whatever. But they put a post on, whenever you need me any time, I'll be there. And yet yeah. when he needed it, they weren't. And the other thing is that it's family as well, or friends. He said nobody picked up on what was wrong or where he was at. And I think that's such important, we've both mentioned, that it's understanding what these are. People seem to get mixed up, and I did this in uh, an episode last year, last season, because it really bothered me, but people not understand their anxiety and depression. Anxiety is like classes, excessive anxiety of most worry days, uh, most things for at least six months. That's when anxiety comes in. But it can also cross over to be depression and people don't always realise. Depression, you need to have one of two core symptoms for at least two weeks. It's as simple as one of them is, during the last month, has the person been bothered by feeling down, hopelessness all the time? Or do they have little interest or pleasure in doing anything? All you need is one of those two things for two weeks and you could actually be classically clinically depressed. And I think the things that people are not realising what you look out for is things like the people say things like they're feeling sad or they're feeling nervous all the time, feeling down. They lose interest in anything you want to do. Maybe as a family, you do things and suddenly they don't want to. But the one big difference between anxiety and depression is anxiety when you get really bad, every little thing bothers you and you get irritable because of it. But when you're depressed, that irritability can turn into violence and anger. You become more withdrawn and isolated. You literally take yourself away from the world, even if you're in family. You, that's why they start using things like alcohol or drugs. It's the only way that they can actually take it out their head and just get away for that small period of time. But even their family does can even bother them. That irritability can be the way the kids make a noise or the wife doing something they don't like or the dinner's not as hot as they want. Sounds silly, these things, but these were things that people gave is the reason why they lost it. Simple things like that is because it builds up. It's not one big thing, depression. It's a multitude of things that's layered and layered and layered until the person you put it there, it could still happen to any of us again. You just get that breaking point and you can't cope. So please, please look out for these signs in the people as well. Because a lot of times, we talked about statues before we come on, and one of the things that was a big shock for me the all, and Dave mentioned that, is how the family said, I never realised, I didn't notice. Surely with these kind of things going on, you must notice. Well, you may think it's the, it's just them. That's the way they are. But if these things are coming up and it's more than one, two, three or four of these things, talk to the person. They need help. That's not something that's just happening. Everybody can have 
an issue of temper, like football things, like people use that as a reason, or oh, it gets worse when football's on. But it's not, it's when the culmination of these things happen, when several of these things keep happening. So that's the one message out today, if nothing else, it's not only to the men out there listening who, if you need help, please ask. If you don't want to do it publicly, then I will put both of our um, websites or email addresses and to where this podcast is going to be. The podcast is also going to be this season, it's going to be on YouTube as well. So either way, you can access it as just a podcast and listen, or you go to YouTube and see this. I'm hoping that they see us as well, we're just ordinary guys going through the same thing as what they've been through. We, as I said, have managed to find a way at the moment of dealing with us, but we're still on journeys. Just please take that message that help anybody, notice anybody that's got it. And if you are a guy that's feeling like these things, whatever age, young, old, anything, please ask somebody for help. And do you want to give our message out from you, Dave? Yeah, and if anybody, you know, would like any help or support, you know, if you want to get in touch with myself or Tony, we'll have links to various different community groups. And, um, you know, I've got quite an excessive list of these kind of groups right across the UK. So there'll be somewhere close to you that we can get you hooked up with to, you know, just be there and offload. You know, I'm a big fan of rugby league and they've got the offload program. Where yeah. all the yeah, rugby players mm -hmm. uh, come in and talk about you, know, you don't need to talk, you can just sit in the energy and just feel part of something. Um, so there's so many things out there, you know. If you've got no belief in yourself at the moment, please borrow our belief because we've all been through it and we know there is hope on the other side. We just need to look for it. And if you need help looking for it, then please get in touch. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time today as well. I appreciate how busy you are. So I appreciate you come on. Um, as Dave said, there is, we'll put these uh, uh, links out so you can get in touch with us. Please, please do that. As we said, it's so important that you have at least an outlet to go to somewhere. And if we can get you put on trombone, then we'll help you get where you want to go. If you want to do it with us, we can help as well. Have a chat with us and see what we can do. Um, join me again next week for episode two, which will be next Wednesday. Um, we're looking at resilience because it's something that Dave mentioned. And I said that something I've really realised recently how it's been such an important thing for me. So I'm going to give you a bit more of my story and how the resilience I found out. But as I said, I'll use this thing again to thank Dave for his story. The session I went with him has made me realise a lot more what I need to do. And it's made a lot clearer, more clarity for myself in my business, but also as a person as well. So thank you for that as well. We're on here. And thank everybody for listening. Join us again so next Wednesday. And we'll have there talking about resilience. If there's anybody out there, though, that wants to come on to this, it is a podcast and a vodcast. You can get your message across. Please get in touch with here. Um, you can see our website behind me there, changeyourmindlimited.com. If you get in touch with it, I'm glad you get you onto the podcast as well and let people hear your story and what you've managed to do to get where you are. Please use that to inspire other people. Thank you, Dave, for the day. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you very much.